What up, what up, what up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Inference Swap, hosted by InferenceSwap.com, brought to you by Barney's Hub Bootery in Crown Point, Indiana, where they have the best snow boots, work boots, ladies' boots, shoes, kids, all of it. So go down there, 1198 North Main Street, and pick up something. And right now, if you go by the end of February, you can get buy one, get one half off. But outside of that, my boy Chris is here. He's back. We are in the midst of a blizzard again. It's like our second blizzard in a couple weeks. So we're running a little late because last time we ran into some bad weather and we couldn't even get together. It was so bad. So we are on the last two chapters of the mystery of Christ. Don't know what we're going to get through today. Probably going to try to get it all taken care of, but... So it's we, a mystery is what you're saying. It's the we're, We've been doing the mystery about the mystery of Christ and why we don't get it. And this week, we're specifically going to talk about George and then the mystery of faith, which is pretty radical. But it's been a good journey. I love the book. It's gotten me thinking. I really loved it early on in the book. It got, mm-hmm. It's challenged us. And here we are, man. What's up, Christopher? You ready to roll on this? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so today, if I guess to go over the format of the book, because we haven't mm-hmm. done this in like a week and a half, is uh, Robert, we'll call him Pastor Robert, Priest Robert, whatever you want to call him, goes in and takes a counseling session in some form, and he gives us those conversations in written form, and then he's got a group of people that are going to analyze what he's talking about and what he said to them and all of that. So today, he's on George. And uh, what do you know about George there, Chris? George is very much unlike the other people he's talked to. You find at the very beginning of the books his different counseling sessions. Most most of the people that are part of his counseling sessions do not see eye to eye with Robert. Um, And then they're usually uh, middle-aged or younger. Uh, George, it says, I believe is in his 80s. Um, He's had uh, some neuropathy. He's had some blood disease issues and he gets to have this you know really cool conversation with Robert he's in the midst of wanting to write a book about his experience and he just it it almost is like the counseling session's been reversed in this section where George goes on and on about what he's going through and how he's relating that to Jesus and Christ and Capon's you know and he said I'm not saying this very clear and Capon or you know, priest Robert, you know, keeps coming back to him saying, I think you're explaining it well. You're actually capturing, you know, very well what I'm trying to say. And what is he trying to say? Uh, what, what did you think of old George? I mean, he's obviously gone through a lot. Mm-hmm. He's very sick. Yes. And it doesn't look like he's getting better and he's right. old. So that doesn't help. But mm-hmm. what, what did you get from what George would... Let's just share what some of the things that he took away from George's conversation with... Uh, Capen. Mm-hmm. So uh, what we find with George is because of his illnesses, he, you know, is he's just had a really rough e- medical experience and everything. It says he's uh, tried to, because of his illness, he, I believe, had to quit work and just really lost a sense of identity and even tried to take his life a few times. And he says he doesn't really know how he came to be he didn't work on it he just woke up in the morning and felt this peace of christ over his life and you know he says it's ebbed and you know ebbed and flowed a few times but overall it stayed there and what he really you know comes to the point of you know like i said what, what robert's saying like this idea of the mystery of christ being universally present in all time and space because mm. uh george says at one point You know, even if I go into the most outer of darknesses, I know Christ is still with me. It thinks about like, you know, like uh, King David, you know, if I go to here, you are there. If I'm in Sheol, you are there. You know, it's just this all this never ending presence of God. And George relates that back to his peace uh, that he experiences with that. Yeah. And which which is interesting. He never really says the word Christ. Correct. And and, (laughs) and we'll get into that. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I did find it fascinating, and I think you hit the perfect scripture. Mm-hmm. With the one you just mentioned about whether I go to Sheol, what was it again? Yeah, if I go to Sheol, you were there, yeah. Yeah, and that's really a great way to to uh, 
describe what he's going through. And he comes to this peace. And for, <clears throat> I think it speaks to Capen because here's a man who's been through sickness, loss of life, mm -hmm. loss of uh, uh, job, loss of who he was. And very much, I mean, I met some people at the shoe store this way today, or I think it was today where um, a 93 year old athletic, uh, I think Olympic skier came in. She's mm -hmm. 93 years old and now she's in braces. Mm -hmm. And she's like, whoever said the golden years are the golden years needs to be punched in the face. That's <laughs> the exact quote, you know. And we don't realize, like, to me, it's this feeble old lady. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, 93 years old. And perfect health as far as, if you don't look at her legs, like her legs are, she's literally got them like strapped up from the ankle to, uh, you know, where you put the inserts in the yeah. shoe, the whole yeah. thing. And, and here's was this athlete at one time. But, but um, I guess the reason I mention that is because we don't realize who's in front of us, what they're going through. And I think it speaks to Capen because he understands it uh, intellectually, I think, and probably through experience, like the mystery of Christ, mm -hmm. but it's sort of a confirmation yeah. for him, and it's not a theological confirmation, per se, like right. we would think of it. Would you get you get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's experiential. Yeah, and they get into a little bit of that too, yeah. like um, you know, the different ways to believe, but um, that peace is sort of what like a uh something that because of what christ did is offered to the world and is there to be accepted is mm -hmm. is that how you sort of got that well as you know he doesn't really and this comes up in the next chapter he doesn't really pinpoint down jesus of nazareth the christ or anything like that it it, it I would say, like, his, the way George talks about God, it's more in that more mystical type tradition of things. And mm. so for him, that peace is that overwhelming assurance of his acceptance of exactly how he is. That he doesn't have to come with this idea of worth and everything that our society dictates, but he feels this overwhelming peace of assurance that who he is in that exact moment is holy enough. Yeah. And, there's a quote that he makes here. He says, when Christians think about Jesus giving them peace or acceptance or forgiveness or whatever you want to call it, they very often picture it to themselves the wrong way. They imagine that Jesus is somewhere else right? and he's not with them, but apart from them. And I think, mm -hmm. I think we have a tendency... Uh, I think that's sort of why prayer is important because you feel this connection with God or you yeah. feel like it's a relationship with God. And when things get to be more noticeable uh, in mm -hmm. the tangible life around us, I think it's a sign that we're really not praying enough. You know, we're feeling the, mm -hmm. the, the reality and that peace is sort of lifted outside that relationship. But the relationship is immediate because it's always been there. Right. Do you get, do you think that you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's that's one thing you know uh, that section you're talking about that Capen talks about that we we either you know if if you do believe in the Christian God typically the way most people associate it is that you know God or, you know it's Jesus is extremely far and distant held in this one location called heaven. Mm -hmm. But we find through the extension of his Holy Spirit, he is actively with us in all locations and times and places. And so for one thing that's really helped me with prayer, like you're talking about, is before I came to that understanding, prayer was almost like me talking into a void, hoping that the words make it there. Yeah, make, and, make it to where, heaven. And, and, and now it's more every time I pray, it's I'm tapping into the communion with Christ that's already with me. So it's almost like I prayer is me opening it up and inviting him in more. Yeah, it, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Right, right, thing, right. Just let yeah. me in. Now, he says something. Uh, so he goes on to say, and I just wanted to tap on this. He says that imagine they imagine that Jesus is somewhere else. Either they think he's a character back in history. Right. Or if they believe he's God, they think he's far away, which you said. Mm -hmm. But in either case, they think it's up to them to earn his presence in their lives. Right. 
Unfortunately, he says, the church has often encouraged that kind of thinking. Do you agree with that? It's in a lot of aspects, sure. And how? Uh, I think a lot of it is it's just that idea, too, that, that reassure, you know, that just neglecting that idea of like tapping into the Holy Spirit who's always with you. Like, it's this idea of like prayer, like, um, sending your hearts out in prayer to God. And that's usually relayed in a fashion of God's out in heaven. So we're crying out like the Egyptians, you know, in Exodus. God, you know, is in heaven, you know, stoops down and says, I've heard their prayers. It's almost like that kind of thought process yeah. that when the, you know, a lot of times when the church asks people to call out to God, it's not calling out to God who's literally right in breath's length against you. It's this God maximally distant away. And if we, you're such and, a and, sinner that you haven't, right, yeah, called, called yeah, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah in so, the right way. Right. And, and it's always this idea of, like, this idea of, like, pen, you know, penance and also, like, just repentance. This idea of repentance, which is very good has turned into this idea of God is wholly distant, and when you repent, then he comes to you, as if, like, your sin is a force field against him. Yeah, I mean, and I don't know if this is off topic or not. I don't think it is. But I, when I hear people talk about holiness, mm -hmm. and I, we've mentioned this a couple times, Yeah, I, mean, I just don't know. I mean, I've only been doing this 20 years. I have no idea what they're talking about. Because, mm -hmm. like, I had a friend who posted today who I admire and mm -hmm. I like him. He's like, you know, like, the church is going to get it for not being holy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, according to who, what is holy and who makes right. that standard of holy. Right. And if you think you can be perfect as Christ, as God, be perfect as God was perfect, yeah. you're insane. Yeah. So I think we tend to, and you, and I think it goes into the later discussion where he talks about, how we read the Bible, how we interpret mm. death and resurrection. Um, but I, I really just don't get it at all. Like, and I think it's because when we come up through a tradition or through denominationalism, which has created more problems than it's solved, in my view, um, do you think it's because uh, it, it, they don't read or look for that relationship through grace? Grace is something that's offered and they accept. It's accepted transactionally. And it's not something that's an invitation into a relationship where mistakes will be made. Not mm -hmm. on his part. Right. But ours. I mean, how do you view that idea of holiness in this conversation here? Uh, specifically toward, like, the church or toward this book we're talking about? Well, I think there's a, a very a correlation. I'm just trying to uh -huh. tap into what people might be going through. Mm -hmm. I know I certainly went through it. Like, when they say holy, I have no idea what that means. Does that mean more prayer, mm -hmm. more church attendance, uh, do what the pastor says? Does it mean live by these fundamental truths? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what they're talking about. And then I, I just put, as he put that, like, and if we don't. Oh. So what if I'm not holy? Right, right, right. You know what I mean? To me, holiness is something that was appropriated in the cross. It was something mm -hmm. that could only be fulfilled by somebody who was perfect. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we can only be in him. So it's not something we achieve. It's something he achieved on our behalf. And by living out faith, we get that righteousness in exchange mm -hmm. for our sin. That's how I understand the gospel. But, I mean, over and over, I mean, like... In the assemblies, I'll just say it, in the assemblies of God, I, I just think they have a, a terrifying, horrifying view of holiness, mm -hmm. which is almost preventative of people uh, getting to grace. I think it's a prevention of grace. But that's my, I mean, that's where I stand right now. It could change. I mean, how do you view it? Because he's talking about these kind of things, like, trying to earn the presence of God in our lives, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's where I would say most people, when they view holiness, I think they're just m misinformed is maybe a, a, the word I want to use because, you know, I'm always, I'm pretty, I always try to be optimistic and just assume the best of people. And I would say most people that I've come across when they view holiness 
it's not I don't hear in their language I need to be better so that I you know in the sense of I need to be a quote unquote better Christian it's I want to experience God more, so I'm going to do these things in order to receive it, which yes. is not a bad thing, but it ends up becoming this work of, because I got up and read my Bible for 50 minutes in the morning, like I was, I was hearing the other day, one of my friends said, I just need to get up earlier. Like, I'm already reading, I'm already praying, I just need to get up earlier. And I'll t it's almost like, if I put enough, you know, dollars in the till so to speak like yeah. you know in one the morning, day i'm gonna hit jackpot yeah 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 and, and i'll receive this amazing experience of god where it's you know i i the more and more i've become more friends with people who are not part of the church who've been extremely hurt by it i'm finding that you know like reading scripture all this stuff very important but it's almost like when are you going to get up and actually do it because a lot of people, like myself, really, true. My my natural disposition is read more and just learn more, learn, learn, learn. And what you find is that actually a lot of times God's like, just go do it, and you'll learn as you go. Like it doesn't have to be this school session well, every yeah, morning. And I'm not even talking about quote how to live as a Christian. I'm, right. We're talking in his in this book, like the mystery of Christ is that. Christ is always present, in it, and it's you can't earn that presence. You get that presence right, right. based on his work. So this idea of holiness that I've seen it in, let's say, um, you know, oneness churches mm -hmm. where there is no trinity. Right. Hardcore fundamentalist Baptists. I, I hear it in the Assemblies of God. I hear it in Baptists about this idea of holiness to be perfect and to me that just i'm not saying don't pursue relationship with christ which is all i think he wants he just wants to be in right see we're trying to get in and it's really all you have to do is accept his acceptance right so once you do that it's not even that you're in it's he's in yeah yeah <laughs> you know what i mean like he's not rejecting us mm -hmm. we're just not accepting him mm -hmm. and so this pursuit of what, whether it be more, I mean, how many times, you know, more scriptures, more programs, more, you know, we got to get them involved in this and it's exhausting. Yeah. And I love the, the sort of the Vegas kind of thing where you're putting coins in the, what is that? The, the slot machine. The slot machine. And you're, you're just pulling that lever, hoping one day that you're holy enough that his presence will make this big thing in your life. And you're not realizing He's been there all along. Right. You know, it's like it's almost like a guy who gets married, and even though the girl's next to him and she loves him, she, he, he's got to go get her the mansion, mm -hmm. the car. Oh yeah. And she never asked for any of that. You know what I mean? That's how I view holiness. It's yeah. Like, and and then it comes down to interpretation of scripture, which I do think you know, like scripture has given us enough to come into this relationship with God. But I'm not sure that if, I'm not sure we're supposed to take scripture as law. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure we're not supposed to. Like, we're supposed to see scripture through what he's done mm -hmm. and grace. And, you know, when we're dealing with people, obviously there's things we should not do and should do. You know, like go and sin no more. Well, nobody's going to do that. Right. I'm not even going to try to work for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why waste your time with these things? So... I think it's so important. I think there's a certain... The reason I bring this up is because I think it's killing the church, one. And two, I think there's a freedom that it really brings, and it brings us closer to faith. The further we get away from that mentality, the closer we get towards faith. Because when we have to walk in something unfamiliar, mm -hmm. and we're familiar with law, we're familiar with... Rules of the church and rejection mm -hmm. of the church and stuff like that, or, or vice versa, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think I'm saying something wrong there? Mm -mm. No. I, I I'll tell you what. Um, they ask him what's it, or uh, 
So we're talking about this idea that nobody has to look for where Christ is. Mm -hmm. And did you um, see this little parable about the dance? Do you remember that? Yeah. You have it up, so if you want to read it. He says, I just loved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I don't have a page because I'm doing it digitally. Right. So he says, you know what it's like, George? So what we're talking about is, the presence of the mystery of Christ is that everything that Christ has done and all that's accessible through Christ is accessible now in the present. That we don't have to like throw and kick our hands mm. and do all these rituals to be in his presence. We just meet him by faith. And so he goes, What's it like? George is going like, What's it like? And he goes, Here's an illustration. You know what it's like, George? It's like a dance, a big formal party that everybody's already been invited to and present at. Now what happens at a dance? When the dance starts to play, everybody decides to trust the new world of the dance and act accordingly. They move in harmony with the music. But when the band takes a break, they go back to acting in accordance with their old world with the way and, and uh, that they know better. Mm -hmm. you, are you following me on this? Yeah. yeah. says husbands and wives get into arguments. Some people drink too much. Other people make... You know, uh, bad real estate do or deals and so on and so on. It goes. If you think about it, it gives you a much better pictures of what Christians are really supposed to be, because the dance that God has invited us all to, the dance of the mystery of Christ, is always going on. The band playing the music of forgiveness never takes a break. The music of the mystery, of course, is hidden music. We have to trust that it's being played. And for anyone who doesn't trust, it's just as if there's no music going on at all. Christians, therefore, are not some select group that have music that nobody else has. They're simply people who, by faith, by trust, always hear the music of the mystery of Christ that the whole creation has been provided with. And so the real job of Christians, as far as the world is concerned, is to simply dance to the music. Man, I love that. And to try, by joy, of their dancing, to wake up the world to the party that's already going on, basically. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. Is that... I mean, I think the reason for his book is because he doesn't see that. How do you feel? I mean, how do you... What do you see in what we're doing as Christians right now? I mean... Are we living like there's a dance? Do you have your disco shoes on? Please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that the way it's relayed in most circumstances is that our our job right now is to clean up ourselves in anticipation for the dance that will one day be. If that makes sense. So instead of the dance occurring right now, it's some dance in the distant future, which we call like the second return of Jesus or whatever. And you're talking this is the position of the church? Yeah. Okay. And, that, and then until that time, the church's job is to help get people cleaned up for the dance. Right. right. And then what do you think he's saying by the dance? If it's not that. That's, that's the Holy Ghost conversation, right? Right, there. right, right. We're yeah. just constantly uh -huh. trying to get Satan off our back, like, you know what I mean? Constantly yeah. fighting uh, uh, invisible wars that aren't even there. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, and that's the whole idea of the dance is he's saying the dance is going on currently. And so, Christ, you know, Christians are, as he said earlier in this book, as a sacrament or a reflection back to what's actually happening. And so, it, you know, through our expression of it to others, we get to invite them into what we're experiencing. I, I love that. And so he gets into, we're going to get into the second part of this now because it's already a half hour into this. Mm -hmm. And he starts talking about back into the mystery of faith and into uh -huh. um, how we start, I guess, believing in what Christ has done, which mm -hmm. I thought was pretty fascinating. You know, you know what I'm, you want to explain that part of it? or uh, I'll go for it. So they get into how, how do we know, there's, there's a modern way of looking at Jesus' death and resurrection, mm -hmm. and then there's the traditional way. 
And if I'm getting this right, the, the modern way... Oh, what's the word that he put in there? Oh, the Christ event? Is that the modern way? So that that's, as in essence, like... It's a historical thing that possibly happened, but it's... Oh, am I thinking this right? It's, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's Christ, but it's only seen through the experience you have with Christ. So, is right. That, is that right? It, in, in essence. So, what he's alluding back to is, like, Rudolf Boltman and these yeah. type of... And when he says modern, he's talking 1950s. Yeah, sure. German high education. You know, this is your Rudolf Boltman, you know, and those type of guys. He was a really big popular one. Um... But anyways, what they're talking about the Christ event is it's not so much that they're saying flat out that they're saying the question is not did Jesus literally physically bodily rise from the dead? It's was the experience of the disciples and the followers that that's the important thing. So they're saying that the experience of what they have so, yeah, is a non, greater it's than non, non, it didn't really happen. It could have. It doesn't. The requirement of what they experienced is not prevalent on the fact that it actually have occurred. So what they're saying, like Rudolf Boltman and these different people, is they're saying, yeah, Jesus may have died and not physically risen, but the disciples experienced his risen nature so much that, like a myth, it actually is the more truth than what the event actually was. Uh, okay. Yeah. So he calls that that idea the Christ event. And so it's not, it doesn't require that Jesus literally rose from the dead. So that is where that distinction between the traditional, which I think you and I believe, yeah. versus... And he the, does, too. Yeah, and versus the quote-unquote modern Christ event. And, and he said whether you... Yeah, so there's the two uh, sort of views. One is the Christ event approach that modern scholars sort of hold, and it's gotten worse towards our time. Yeah. And then the actual historical mm -hmm. traditional view which I hold and you hold and he what I did find fascinating about this and I think we felt it sort of in a roundabout way me and you I can speak for uh, we will we've we've studied the resurrection the apologetics sure. the historical evidence so for us that's a that's a win mm -hmm. that's it is true but he's still in saying, even though you have that knowledge no matter which way you go you're still stuck with the leap of faith Correct. You know what I mean? And, it, and and so you still have to take... So what to you is the leap of faith? Let me. What does he mean by that? I, I think the, the leap is, yeah, you can intellectually know something, but you still have to invite that to be part of your experience, which always requires a trust of something you don't have full confidence in. Yeah, and I, I think this, if I can say this, and you can get into this too, I know you're going to love this when I say this probably because this is right up your alley, mm -hmm. Mr. Intellectual <laughs> Theologian. But this to me is how you understand uh, the book of James and mm -hmm. and reconcile it with Ephesians, which where he's talking about yeah. grace and grace alone. Right. And James is talking about if you have faith, but yet you do not do mm -hmm. these things... Well, even the demons believe in God right. and shudder, you know. So I think this is sort of, there's an evidence that takes place in your life that is lived out, right? But the evidence, the works themselves are not what saves you. Mm -hmm. They're just uh, a manifestation or a fruit of what God's doing in you. But we're not to judge. I mean, I, I think we can look at the works of our lives and go, is our heart where it should right, be? right. But it's ultimately God that judges the heart. And, um, but it is interesting in the end times, God will judge us by our works, which sort of tells us where our hearts were, you know. And I think, uh, I think you're right about that leap of faith. It's like taking a step to take steps into who it, what it means uh, to be in relationship with Christ. And that's going to be a different speed. Uh, it's going to go downhill and take off from somebody. And it's going to be an uphill climb for others. And, yeah. And, uh, but I, I really found that fascinating uh, that, you know, no matter where we're at, I think the struggle for everyone, Christian or not, is living by faith. Mm -hmm. It is so much easier not to. Yeah. You know what I mean? We can rely on our jobs, rely on our finances, 
rely on our spouses and our relationships, anything but him. And then when you get into that world, I mean, you could literally, uh, you can literally like, I guess, not only rely on that stuff, but that stuff can, can be more important and you until you discover that God actually put those things in your life mm-hmm. to see how you can manage faith in all areas of life. You know, I mean, to me, when I read the book of Leviticus, which is a really weird thing, to, the, the book of Levit- 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 Leviticus, mm-hmm. if it says anything to me, it's that God wants to be in all areas of your life. Mm-hmm. But we can't do it. There's more unbelief in us in areas of our life than there is belief. And so we have to step in faith in these different areas. And so I I think that's really, um, I guess, something that we really need to chew on is what we have when we act in faith, what we have in this relationship through faith. And so, yeah, I just don't know what else is there in this chapter that I'm missing anything. That. That's pretty much it. Yeah, that last that last chapter is pretty much what you just said, broken out and talked about in different ways. So what will be the implications of our, our faith? What will be the implications of our life in faith? Mm-hmm. I hope that this podcast right here over the last so many weeks that we've gone through yep. has really drawn you closer to not only what grace is, not only the freedom you have in grace, Uh, but to what Christ has done and what he's offering. And so my final question for for you today Mm -hmm. is, we started off with this piece. We end up with him talking about the mystery of Christ. How does that all sum up together? The mystery of Christ throughout the whole book? I mean, like how this two chapters, if you had to finalize it, what it is, and then I'm going to go back to his five points and we're going to call it. Okay. So, I mean, like, well, sum up this chapter. How does George's piece mm-hmm. and him talking about all this mystery of Christ stuff go together? Yeah, I, I think the one of the big things that Capen tries to get across with his group in the last chapter is George may not be, quote-unquote, as theologically fine-tuned as what they may want him to be. Uh, even as Capen says, I wish he was me. But what the point is, is that the mystery of Christ is there with George, even in his, you know, theological immaturity or whatever. And that the faith is trusting, no matter where you're at in that journey, that you're on the journey with God and that he will never leave you. I, I think that's pretty pretty succinctly what that idea of faith is it's he calls it a dance you know i call it more of a journey it's just walking hand in hand with god through life together awesome all right so i wanted if it's okay with you i wanted to read how he sums up his book and he does he goes you know basically he goes all right i think i've already said everything i want to say at length so let me give you a shopping list of items i set out to cover in this book okay And there pretty much are seven chapters in this book, so Mm -hmm. here they are. Number one, the mystery of Christ is none other than the mystery of the incarnation of the Word of God, of the eternal Son, the second person of the Holy and undivided Trinity. So the mystery of Christ is Him, right? The mystery of Christ is indeed a mystery. It's hidden. It's a hidden fact of the universe that can only be believed. It only can be trusted. It cannot be directly known by or proved by our intellect number three nevertheless the mystery of christ has been revealed revealed to us in the bible generally and above all it has been specifically sacramentalized meaning made ready present for us historically in christ and in the church witness by the word and sacrament in other words Mm -hmm. communion to the presence of our risen and ascended lord jesus so it can be made known i think that's great those specific historical sacrament and sacramentalizations, notwithstanding, uh, the mystery of Christ is a common, a common, a cosmic Catholic mystery. Catholic meaning it's a universal mm-hmm. mystery for everyone, intimately and immediately present by the power of God to all places, times, and people. It is not the property of the church, nor is it confined to the church. 
and it is not in any way local, a localized phenomena that extends itself only to those individuals who made a transactional response. And that speaks to my denomination, mm -hmm. I could say that. Uh, therefore, far from being a merely metaphysical truth or metaphysical precept, uh, per mystical perception. Thank you. I don't know why I'm stuck. So it says, therefore, by being a merely a metaphysical me metaphysical truth or mystical perception, the mystery of Christ is the action of a person doing something. Namely, making a new creation in and for us. It's simply something to be discovered by sp speculation or inner experience. It's the presence of someone who is there for us, regardless of what we believe, think, or feel. Consequently, this is number six, the mystery of Christ has, n has more than just an existence we might debate. It has a name, and that name, we believe, is Jesus. And so, finally, number seven, to conclude, Jesus as the Word of God incarnate is our life, yours and mine, and the whole world. We dwell in him, and he dwells in us, and he is the joy of all desiring. And that sums it up. Mm -hmm. Good with that? Yeah. Anything you want to say as we shut down this last uh, <laughs> book, and then we'll get back into whatever we want to do next. Uh, is this weather gets crazier and crazier yeah uh no i think we pretty much this was a good summing chapter of everything i really do believe that i love capen i hope people will listen to what we've been talking about and it drives them closer to christ and it gives them more freedom in christ to live out something uh that's very beneficial to them which is a relationship with jesus all right everyone thank you for listening i'm john that's chris Thank you. I hope we've broken down some presuppositions uh, and some precepts and all these these concerns we bring to uh, everything. And I hope you've gotten stronger and more informed. Thanks for listening to Inference Swap. We'll be back, I don't know, next week with something or something will be happening next week. We're going to figure it out. But until then, if you've missed something, go back and listen to it. Thanks and God bless. <laughs>